Nearly half of residents in Accra and other communities near the capital will be without water supply for four days, beginning Monday, 24 February. The service disruption is to enable the Ghana Water Company to undertake some major rehabilitation works at the pond treatment plant. Residents in the areas to be affected, including Tema, Adenta, Dodowa, Jowulu, and Kokumlemle, are therefore being advised to store enough water before next Monday. The four-day water shortage is as a result of expansion and rehabilitation works at the Pond Water Treatment Plant, which serves a third of Accra. We have a project we call Pond Intake and Atma Rural Water Rehabilitation and Expansion Project. And the project has got to a point where the contractors need to do some interconnections. They are going to connect a new 72-inch diameter raw water pipeline to an existing fiberglass 60 inch diameter raw water pipeline so the new one is now going to be connected to the new uh, the old one and this is going to take about three four days for the contractors to finish the work other areas to be affected include Medina, Athena, East Legon, Kwabenya, Taifa, Domi, Pig Farm, Mamubi, Osu, La, Smintex Road, and Cantonments. Communications manager at the Ghana Water Company Limited, Nana Yao Berry Mabani, outlined some measures put in place to mitigate the impact of the four day service disruption. What we would want residents and our value customers to do is first to try and store as much water as they can so that during the period of the interruption they will be able to rely on the water that they have stored to last them for the period. And what we are also going to do in Tema is that we are going to store some water in our terminal reservoir at Ashama. That is our booster station at Ashama. Officials also noted the company has mobilized its own tankers in addition to other private tankers operators to supply water to schools, hospitals and other essential service providers and institutions in the affected communities. Officials say the expansion works when completed will add an additional 12.3 million gallons of water daily to augment the already 40 million gallons of water produced daily by the Pond Water Treatment Plants. Patients at the Tamale Teaching Hospital are alleging widespread corruption and extortion by staff there. According to them, the situation, if not checked, will negatively affect healthcare delivery at the facility, which serves people from all over the northern region and beyond. Join us this Hashmin Mohammed, Father's Report. So, after everything, they called me and, and told me that uh, we have to pay uh, 26 Ghana CD. Okay. And we asked, what, what, what are we paying? They injected the baby and the mother. Okay. That's what we are paying for. Okay. So we gave them 30 Ghana cities, and they asked us that they don't have change, that they don't have change for a uh, four city for us. No, they didn't give us receipt, and they didn't, they didn't tell us, don't know what can, and we didn't see. We didn't see what kind of injection they gave the baby. But I was, was going to deliver it. She gave her a baby boy, girl this evening. They asked us to pay 30 Ghana cities for our discharge fee. I asked them whether I would get receipt for the 30 Ghana cities. They say no. They don't have receipt for that. I asked them why are they quoting me that 30,000, uh, 30 um, 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 cities. They say for medicine. I asked them, ah, is who, the medicine Who, who demanded that money from the, you? The lady at the labor um, ward or department. Is she a nurse? I don't know whether she's a nurse or, but they say she's a I don't know her name, but they call her, they usually call her a jia. She okay. said the medicine that they use for the, um, um, my wife, I should pay that money. I said, I don't have that money. Why health insurance is not coming? They say they don't have a stock in their pharmacies. Even if they have it, it's finished. Some nurses do not only extort monies from poor patients. Labor wards at the hospital have become grounds for trading activities. Patients are forced to buy detergents from staff against the hospital's own rules of engagement. Head of nursing services at the hospital, Al Haji Abdul Kadil, confirms. We don't need to have any you know, official complaint because it's all over the place. But there is no one 
no single sheet of paper that has come official to my notice. Not even the areas they are complaining about. But that doesn't mean that I am saying that there are no problems there because in every human institution there are problems. And the problems are there because we come from different angles. We could be professionals, but we definitely have our own upbringing. We have our interpersonal relationship and all that. These are all things that when we are dealing with professionals, whether we like or not, they will all play a part. So all that we are saying is this, uh, whether the report is with me or not, is something I'm hearing. So I have started going into it one after the other. Patients complain about the unavailability of drugs at the hospital. They say they are always approached by middlemen in the ward who readily provide the drugs at extra cost. Alhaji Hudu Idrisu is regional director at the National Health Insurance Authority in the northern region. We cannot make such a blanket statement that uh, hospital staff are stealing, they are thieves. I believe that we have a majority of the staff who would not steal. And even if they get other people stealing, they would report them. But the truth of the matter is that this is a, this is a human institution and attitudes differ from one person to another. So we cannot say that there are no people who would steal, no matter the kinds of uh, systems that you put in place. But as we speak, we have mounted close to about 28 CCTVs around all parts of the hospital. That is most of the wards, the theaters, and very, very important areas. That is whether they are waiting areas or there are areas that people just don't uh, keep long, but we still would mount those things, the, the CCTVs, just to you know serve as preemptive measure towards people uh, undertaking to stealing. These drugs are not stored or handled properly, exposing patients to risk. Director of Pharmacy at the Tamale Teaching Hospital. Nicholas Ajimani is worried about the trend. They give these drugs to patients, right? They want to induce them, but patients deliver normally. And these drugs are kept by staff of the hospital, who, who later sell to others. Okay? Normally, if you want to deliver, they want to induce you to deliver. But when you're able to deliver normally, then it means that the drugs will not be used on you. Meanwhile, they would have provided it to you already. Okay? That is where the problem comes. These drugs are kept by staff, because they didn't use them, they have them, and then they can, uh, they want to sell it to... Without the approval of the pharmacy? No, they, you see, it's the pharmacy supply, the pharmacy department has supplied the drugs to the ward. You see, they write, the doctors write prescriptions for patients to collect drugs from the pharmacy. The pharmacy has provided the drugs to the patient, it's taken to the ward. You see, the reason was that we, were, uh, we are going to induce the patient to deliver. But for some reasons, the patient delivers uh, normally. So the drugs are not used. Although they, do, they would have been supplied from the... Medical staff can charge an official fees to attend to patients. They may demand bribes for medication which should be free. Fraud, extortion and corruption in health can mean only one thing. The difference between life and death. The poor will be the worst affected. From the Tamale Teaching Hospital, this is Hashmin Mohammed's report for Joy News. Staying with health, members of the Health Insurance Service Providers Association of Ghana are threatening to demand upfront payment for services they render national health insurance subscribers if the Social Security and National Insurance Trust SNIT persists with its prosecution. A number of the members of the HISPAC are currently facing court action for defaulting on the pension contributions of their staff. Speaking at the launch of the association's Upper East Regional Chapter, HISPAC Chief Executive Frank Richard Toblu said SNIT would have to waive the penalties against them since government's failure to settle them for services rendered NHI is to blame for their inability to pay the social security contributions of their workers. Upper East correspondent Albert Torrey has more.
The threat comes on the back of a recent standoff between private health care facility owners providing services to subscribers of the National Health Insurance Scheme over its failure to pay them for their services dating back to July 2013. His pack therefore says SNET would have to be more considerate. The situation would have been different if about 30% or 20% of the total revenue to these providers are coming from uh, National Health Insurance Authority, while 70% or 80% is coming from other sources. That one, it would have been clearly explainable. But where we stand now, the reverse is the situation. So therefore, we are appealing to SNET and GRA to waive all penalties imposed on these people standing trial at court for their inability to pay. A leading member of the association in the Upper East region, Thomas Moore, said private health care providers contribute greatly to health care provisions in the region and therefore it will be a huge burden on the ordinary person should they go back to cash and carry. For the private health care, if you go to a private health care provider and he runs a drug for you to go and buy, they think that something has gone wrong. And that is what they are now forcing us to do. Occasionally we have to provide drugs for patients to go and buy. That one cannot be, uh, cannot, be, cannot be tolerated in our, in our area. So if it continues, someone asks a question that when will you go cash and carry? We will go cash and carry when our funds are dry. Dr. Francis Asana was elected the new Upper East Hills Park chairman. Explain to them and they understand. And if Snitch is going to imprison me because insurer hasn't paid me to pay them, then we will go back to cash and carry. But that we don't want to happen. But when we do that, it is our people we are serving who are going to suffer and not the national insurance authorities. So we are giving ourselves by 20th of this month. If we don't get money hitting our accounts, we will be forced to sell some of the drugs to the patients. Since its launch in 2002 and subsequent passage into law in 2012, the implementation of the patient's charter, which seeks to enforce the rights of patients when seeking health care, still hangs in the balance. Join us as Yafu Swajim for reports patients whom the charter seeks to protect know little or nothing about it, leaving them at the mercy of health professionals who sometimes abuse their rights. It's almost midday and the outpatients department of the La General Hospital is teeming with patients. There are several people here, young and old, all seeking one form of medical care or the other. In a bid to be relieved from their pain, many seem to forget or simply not aware of their rights to ensure they get the best of care. The patient's charter, launched in 2002 by the Ghana Health Service, became law following the passing into law of the Public Health Act in 2012. Under Section 167 of the Public Health Law, a patient has the right to privacy, confidentiality and, and access to quality health service, among others. The patient also has the responsibility to provide his or her full medical history to aid in his or her diagnosis. But two years since the enactment of the law, the charter seems to have lost its relevance as the people it seeks to empower are simply ignorant of its existence. Most patients who spoke off camera were either unaware of the existence of the charter or its contents, especially regarding their rights. A few of the patients, however, told me, though they did not know about the charter, they still insist on what they believe are their rights when seeking treatment at the hospital. I did that once, I did that once, and I didn't get a correct feedback. So, sorry to say, I was very pissed off. So I walked out of the hospital very disappointed. Looking at my circumstance, I think that job is not well done. So I think they need to enforce more resources on that. As a way of making the charter work, some hospitals have made platforms such as suggestion boxes and complaint decks available for patients to register their complaints about services they receive at the hospital. They have a book there where they record and the, from the book is brought to management or the complaint. Then we go through it and resolve it appropriately. Sometimes we have to even call the patient back. We have health education. The morning talks before they come, they are educated on certain basic procedures in the hospital. Where the person feels his, he has, his rights has been infringed upon, he has the option to still come forward to complain to management or any staff. 
but some health experts say the full implementation of the patient's charter will be difficult due to challenges of inadequate number of health workers, especially in deprived communities. The burden in terms of the volume of work on doctors, on pharmacists, on nurses, on biomedical scientists, sometimes the, the standard ratios don't apply. We need to go beyond the law to provide the kind of logistics, the kind of facilities, the kind of numbers in terms of human resource that would make it more easier and more fair to hold health practitioners and, and, and professionals to the requirements of the, the, the patient's right. Ernest Abwaji adds, the growth of private health insurance schemes poses another challenge as healthcare providers sometimes have to disclose the conditions of their patients to get their bills covered. The person who is financing the health, who is financing the care, would want to know what is wrong with the patient. That becomes a third party, okay. or where even the employer is the one financing the, the, the care that you're providing. If that employer wants to know what is wrong with the employee, um, what, what does the health provider or the health facility do? Mm -hmm. Do you refuse to disclose to the financier of the health I mean, I'm sure ordinarily uh, there may be the temptation to, but I think legally speaking, the right to confidentiality would seriously have to be looked at. Though passing the charter into law is a bold step, what remains is for patients to be educated about their rights and responsibilities under the charter, and one can only hope health authorities will take the initiative which will lead to a full implementation of the contents of the charter. Yafusia Jemfi, Joy News, Accra. The Ghana Institute of Surveyor says people seeking to buy land are increasingly falling prey to fraudsters because prospective landowners fail to follow due process in acquiring land. According to its president, issues of land litigation could be minimized if such persons would seek professional help. He was speaking at the 9th Surveyors Week and 45th AGM conference held in Accra. The issue of land ownership has become a subject of discussion following a series of demolition exercises carried out in recent times. The Ghana Institute of Surveyors, however, says a lot of the litigation and distress could have been avoided, especially considering the huge costs involved. You see, what we are not doing right is the fact that we are not um, going by the regulations. See, if you are going to buy land, you have to conduct a search. If you want to develop your land, you must have permit. See, these are rudimentary, but these are the things that we are not doing. And also, there's the certainty of ownership is a big challenge. You know, if you have a situation like this and there's no certainty regarding the ownership, let us ensure that we go by the rules and regulations. That you want to buy that land, you do the appropriate searches. You want to develop you go to the assembly and then you get a permit so that you will not have this unpleasant situation that has gained currency in our country. He also expressed worry about the misappropriation of lands by developers. The way to go is to ensure that every parcel of land that is developed, the development will be in conformity with the planning scheme drawn up or approved for the area. Regardless of who owns it, if thousand people are litigating over land, whether it is government or chiefs or individuals, at the end of the day, whatever it is developed on the land must be in conformity with the planning scheme for the area. If we just develop land indiscriminately, you know, very soon we will not have any land for even to live in, land for recreation, and it will impact negatively on our environment. So we think that if you look at the characteristics or the content of good governance and apply it to our land administration in this country, we will be able to put land to good use. The president further disclosed the institute will be setting up an alternative dispute resolution center to assist landowners and developers to address land disputes. The 9th Surveyors Week and 45th AGM celebration is on the theme Good Governance for Effective Development. Matilda Pomaga for Joy News. Some concerned members of the New Patriotic Party in the Upper East Region are calling on the party's Council of Elders to intervene in the standoff between the party's vetting committee and aspiring national chairman Paul Afoko. The group believes it was unfair for the committee to hold off with the qualification or approval of the aspiring national chairman at the recent vetting. Albert Sorry reports. Why should the composition lack the requisite regional balance to the extent that 
more than 85% appears one-sided. Two, how can an aspirant appearing before a vetting committee be told that a petition had been brought against him just before the vetting process? This is highly unfair. Three, doesn't it natural, doesn't natural justice require that a copy of a petition be made available to the person being petitioned against ahead of the vetting process? As if that wasn't enough, the committee further subjected the innocent aspirant to injustice of the highest order by denying him the right to both content and access of the said anonymous petition. Our party is already being branded as an anti-Northern party. And Paul has been leading the battle against this negative perception by working tirelessly to advance the fortunes of the party here in the North. This savage attempt by some parochial-minded elements within our great party would only be an endorsement of that false perception that a Northerner would never be given the opportunity to lead the party as a chairman. Let us not forget that the tricking effect of such naked expression of unfairness and discrimination against the North can be very devastating when it comes to elections, as every single vote counts in this incoming victory to the party in the 2016 elections. Finally, we seize this media opportunity to appeal to the elders of our great party to bring this wide concern to bear on the vetting committee. Now still to come, the military high command is cautioning against speculations over the death of a military couple at Michelle Camp near Tema. We also hear from the mother, plus yet another tragedy involving a pregnant woman. We have that coming up after the break. Stay tuned. Now every year, most of the medical doctors posted to the three regions of the north refuse to go. This is despite the fact that a good number of doctors come from that part of the country, particularly in the Abba West region. The fact that the region has the poorest doctor-patient ratio in the country is therefore a source of concern and frustration to residents, including regional minister Dr. Ephraim Avianso. Manasseh Azuria, when he recently traveled to the region, and now reports. Uh, I've talked to anybody that I can find that will support to try and see how we can get doctors. In fact, this year, they posted about 10 of them since last year, uh, late last year. And then only about four of them are, have come. If one of them went back, and I'm not sure he's even back yet. Between 2010 and 2012, 35 medical doctors were posted to the three regions of the north. However, none of them accepted posting there. There are 22 hospitals, 94 health centers, 181 functional chips compound in the three northern regions, but most of them do not have medical doctors. Interestingly, a good number of doctors in Ghana come from that part of the country. The Upper West region, for instance, is said to have produced a good number of the country's medical doctors and health specialists. In the Upper West region, some districts do not have medical doctors serving in health facilities there. Upper West Regional Minister Dr. Ephraim Avianso says the current situation is unacceptable. People keep seeing the North as a Siberia, in, in, let's say in quotes, in the sense that it's a place that they are not able to get their lives fulfillment. For instance, I understand that when, while they are doing normal practice, they can do part time, they can attend their school, they can put their children in better schools. I mean, that means they can make extra income. And when they come here, I mean, they might not have, in terms of perception, they might not have the, the kind of school for their children. They might not make as much income, extra income that they will have. They might not be able to make do uh, uh, part-time lectures or online or whatever lectures. They might not have the internet connectivity as they have. The argument many professionals advance against accepting postings to the north is the absence of amenities, such as good schools for their children. 
But Dr. Ephraim Avianso says this argument is flawed, especially for those from that part of the country. There's this kind of wrong perception about the North that it's a difficult place, it's sunny, and it's, it's, it's dusty in, uh, during this time. So that wrong perception about this place to make the people who are supposed to have come here will not come. But the people who come from here, I find it difficult to explain why they are not here. It is those other factors that we have said. And of course, some other cultural factors, they think when they stay here, there is so much pressure on them, and so they might be able to devour as fast as they can. So if there's a serious epidemic, their sisters, sometimes some of, some of them, their wives are here, their blood brothers are here. Now, are they, what would they be doing? Are they going to now mobilize doctors from outside the country or from that? I want to convince them to come and save their own people. So why does the Upper West region produce doctors but does not have doctors to save its people? Dr. Elias Sori is the immediate past director general of the Ghana Health Service and a native of the region. Dr. Sori comes from a village with a population of less than 2,000, but that village has produced four medical doctors. I go home, I talk, we organize meetings. But that is some, uh, something that people don't know, how indigents, even though they might not be there working, they go to encourage, try to support the schools, to let people learn. The health might not be, but the support can be there. I think, uh, yes, others can, can do the same, but let us not look at how many doctors come from there. Let's look at how we can get doctors to be in the place, and we've got the brains to be able to. Manasseh Azuri Awuni's report. The Ghana Armed Forces is cautioning the public against speculating about the recent death of an Air Force officer and her soldier husband. There have been suggestions that the soldier Corporal Copra Fred Nasrami shot the wife, Antoinette Agbagba, and shot himself after their bodies were discovered almost decomposing in the home where the two used to live together. But Director of Public Affairs at the Military High Command says investigations are yet to be conducted into how the death occurred. Meanwhile, the mother of the female of the Air Force officer tells Joy News she implored the daughter not to return to the husband that fateful day. Post bodies of the couples were discovered on Friday. Manjoy Online sources indicated that Corporal Nashramil allegedly used a locally manufactured pistol and shot the wife on the, on the chest at close range, killing her instantly. He then pointed a gun to his neck and shot himself. In narrating the incident, the mother of the deceased Air Force officer, Madame Hodo, said Fred had come to her residence at Kakasunaka No. 1 to pick his clothes, but Antoinette resisted it and insisted on going to pick her things from the man first. there have also been suggestions that Corporal Fred Nasrami could face a military trial even in debt for his alleged actions. But Colonel Mbawini at Intender says it will be too early for people to arrive at that conclusion. Well, uh, our law provides for that, you know, but then there are certain circumstances under which the law applies. So yeah, I believe there's not yet in every case that something like that comes about, you know. Uh, let's say suicide, for example, is a very serious issue as far as the armed forces is concerned. Of course, murder is also another thing that is uh, very, very serious. And in the armed forces, by the armed forces law, we don't try murder. So murder cannot be tried within our own circumstances. But suicide is a different thing, even though it also leads to death. 
you know, but the circumstances will determine what kind of action you know to take subsequently. So it is too early yet to jump to the conclusion that, for example, that somebody is going to be tried you know, at, the, at the end of it. You know, we would have to gather all the evidence, get to the bottom of the matter, and we know which course of action to take subsequently. Meanwhile, sympathizers continue to troop into Madame Hodo's residence to console her. Elsewhere, a young man alleged to have murdered a 28-year-old woman at the Sokovan Wood Village in Kumasi in the Shanti region has been lynched. It is still unknown why Sarah Sechofia, a Choba attendant at the Wood Village, was killed by the assailant Mahmoud Mohamed Nuruddin reports. As a district police has begun investigations into the matter. Police say the woman was clapped to death by an assailant in the early hours of Monday. According to the Asokwa District Police Command, it has not been able to establish the rationale behind the killing. But the suspected murderer, who is unknown to the people at the Wood Village, was pursued and lynched by a mob. The two bodies have been deposited at the morgue. Family and sympathizers have gathered at the house of the deceased to mourn her person. Up next in business with uh, Abigail Aduma Kuinchu, tax experts are cautioning government against simply increasing tax rates in its quest to raise more revenue. Warning, it could backfire. We'll be back with business shortly. Time now for some business reports with me, Abigail Aduma Kuinchu. Now, rating agency Moody's is predicting that the country would end the year spending more than what it generates as revenue. In its latest report on the economy, Moody's says Ghana's deficit would still be in a double digit range by the end of the year, looking at the current spending overruns on the public sector wage bill and the high interest government is paying on current debts. It also warned that the latest foreign exchange controls by the Bank of Ghana would not yield the desired results. The latest projection by Moody's could make it difficult for the country to get the required budgetary funds from its donor partners. Moody's concerns could also have affected the country's plans to raise some $1 billion from the international market. Away from that, the tax policy advisor at the finance ministry, Dr. Edward Labissian, says only the non-core financial services of banks will attract the newly introduced 17.5% VAT. He adds that the VAT charged on these services, which include legal and accounting advisory, safe custody of cash, among others, will commence by close of next month. The newly introduced 17.5% value-added tax on some services which were previously exempted from taxes, particularly on financial services, seem to be causing jitters in the bank sector. There are concerns the VAT will be charged on day-to-day -day services such as maintaining customer current accounts, transferring money, issuing bank drafts and checkbooks, among others. But the tax policy advisor at the finance ministry, Dr. Edward Labissian, explains there is no cause for alarm as it is just some selected financial transactions which will attract the new VAT. The normal financial services that it, you open an account, they keep your account, are not going to be affected. In fact, the last time we met the banks, they were of the view that it's going to affect their 3 million customers. No. What is going to be affected are the non-core financial services. If there is a bank offering legal services, like an ordinary lawyer in his chambers. That is non-core bank. And many people wouldn't go to a bank normally. They go to the bank to save. Mm -hmm. So majority of people who bank are not going to be affected. He was sure the move, although delayed, will be affected by the ending of March. The final tax is 17 point five but at various stages. The banks in doing the, those services may buy inputs for which they will pay the seventeen point five. So if they are giving you the service they will charge the seventeen point five but credit themselves with the previous one. So the full impact is never seventeen point five at the end. There's a temporary break in its implementation, mm -hmm. and we are meeting to clear which areas, and immediately we we'll we'll get the areas that we have to tax, it will be implemented. But we don't have too much time, it will be done 
maybe at the end of March. Dr. Edward Labisian also maintained the technical committee is still negotiating with the banks to agree on the modalities and the list of services they render to clients that are taxable and will make them public once they are agreed on. Abigail Adumakwenchi for Joy News. We we'll still stay on taxation and tax experts have warned that government's pension to simply increase taxes without addressing loopholes in the system could backfire. Government is therefore being advised to be bold and think up more innovative ways to broaden the tax net. The advice comes at a time that government is faced with a ballooning wage bill which is putting pressure on its resources. Etonamsi has more. The country currently spends more than what it collects as revenue, while 60% of what is collected also goes to settle public wages. Another worrying statistic is the fact that only a third of the 6 million eligible taxpayers actually pay. Government has therefore been looking at ways to widen the tax net to meet revenue shortfalls. Tax experts are, however, worried most of what has happened so far has been increases in taxes. If currently hearings are passing through the loopholes, when you widen with those loopholes, tilapia will go through it. No more hearings, meaning the big defaulters will now have impetus to evade tax. We can start from various sectors. If we take the professionals, chartered accountants, lawyers, doctors, HR practitioners, consultants, people belong to associations. Before you can practice, you need a license. That license is your card that earns you the income. If you don't have the license, you can't practice. Can the government revenue sit down with the various associations and groups? If you are not up to date with your taxes, you don't produce a tax clearance certificate, you don't get your license renewed. We have the Registrar General's Department. If this is well linked with the revenue authorities, they should be able to identify the new businesses that are coming up. Another means is to track the imports right from the ports to whoever the wholesalers are for that importer down to the retailer of that wholesaler and then use that to rope down to see how much you can capture. He adds, if government keeps increasing VAT on products and services, people will spend less. Instead of buying tinned canned food, let's say sardine or excuse me to say tin apa, mackerel, I'll go and buy the salmon from the market. Do I pay VAT on that? That is the problem. So we have to look at some of these things. As and when you are increasing prices, people are moving from consuming the taxable items to the non-taxable items. I'm not saying that uh, salmon, or that's the typical how you pronounce it, that salmon on the market is not good. It is good, it is nourishing. But then you're losing the revenue by these adjustments. The tax policy advisor at the Ministry of Finance, Dr. Edward Labisian, meanwhile says government's approach has not been as simplistic as is being suggested. We are directing our effort towards education until the programs that we are uh, turning out, there is a, a full computerization system that is e-government, a World Bank project that is going to register all taxpayers, both individuals and companies. Eton Amsi, Joy News. Trade and finance ministers from West Africa are currently meeting in Dakar, Senegal to recommend the signing of the economic partnership agreement with the EU. The meeting has been necessitated by an earlier recommendation by a committee for the region to sign the pact. Joy Business gathers that the ministers are expected to approve the EP and forward it to the various ECOWAS heads of state to finally sign the agreement. Sources say the ministers would rather be pushing for some amendments to be made to the 16 billion euros 
fund meant to support countries that would be affected by the agreement in terms of revenue losses. Joy Business also gathers that the process is being fast-tracked for the various heads of state to sign the final agreement at the EU-Africa Summit in April. And that will be all by way of business. I'm Abigail Adamakwinchi. Keep abreast with business news on myjohnline.com. Well, let's find out what's top of the agenda in the world of sports. And the organizing committee of the MTNFA Cup competition has confirmed Holders Medium SE alongside a number of clubs in this year's competition have been earmarked for sanctioning for various degrees of breaches, which each likely to attract a fine of 1,500 Ghana cities. Title holders Midyama SC as well as Stack FC and Bibiani Gold Stars have been found guilty of disallowing sanctioned cameramen to cover their MTN FA Cup home matches and are liable to 1,500 Ghana cities fines each as per the regulations of the Ghana Football Association. The FA Cup committee also raised concerns over recent acts of violence at some FA Cup centres, stating that four cases have been forwarded to the disciplinary committee, despising reports from centres of games including Stack versus Hazakas, Sampa versus Okwell United, Istanbul versus Inter Allies, where fans attacked the referee after losing on penalties have been referred to the appropriate bodies for sanctioning. The round of 16 matches of the 2014 FA Cup competition has been scheduled for February 20 to 23, 2014. Now, the Confederation of African Football and European Football Association will sign a memorandum of understanding which will see the development of various aspects in the game in the coming days. CAF member associations will benefit from the MOU that will hold till next year. The Confederation of African Football and the Union of European Football Associations are set to grow closer with the signing of a memorandum of understanding on Thursday at the CAF headquarters in Cairo. CAF President Issa Hayatu and UEFA President Michel Platini will sign the MOU of Mutual Cooperation on Development of Football in Africa and Europe between the two confederations. The MOU, which will be held valid till July 31, 2015, and open to renewal, is meant to strengthen cooperation between the two confederations and provide a framework for exchange and dialogue. This will be achieved through the sharing of information, experience and conducting joint technical development programs relating in various fields such as coaching, refereeing, youth football, women's football, organization of competitions, administration, marketing, media and social responsibilities. And tonight on a pugilistic note, because cruiserweight Brian Makamoko, popularly known as Bukumbanku, has confirmed to Joy Sport his step up preparation ahead of the match anticipated April 18 grudge bout with rival Michael Aite Okain, also known as Aite Powers, at the Crossword Stadium. Bukumbanku, who insists on stopping Aite Powers in the sixth round, says he's on course to achieve his target. All the Ghanaians are make this fight very, very, uh, very big fight. Oh, me, me, I go stop at 80 powers. Whether rain or shine. Me, that day, I'll train, I'll train more than 80 powers. I have power than 80 powers. I know boxing from 80 powers. I have ring experience for 80 powers. I have big, big blows for 80 powers. In my spiritual knowledge, I have for 80 powers. You know, he preparing ourselves very well. Try backgrounds. Because always me, I pray, I pray for God. You know, Juju, I'm, I'm not talking about Juju. If it's spiritual knowledge, me, I have God, I have Allah. Anytime I use Quran to pray for God, He help me. God can stand this fight for me. Because me, I want to stop at 80 powers in Rasevi, whether rain or shine. Bossing, do you know the inside? If you do the bossing, Nigeria people take all the tatty, India, Senegal people take all the tatty. Bossing, do you know the inside? Training man perfect. From America, Britain. Some people call me Bangu because of you. I come and because of Aita Powers. I come and see this fight because this fight is the master. Oh, Aita Powers. Hey, wah, hey, wah. Can't follow like, you. You do get your fault. If you first follow Aita Powers, you do get yourself. Well, so spiritual knowledge, all the blows, and he says he has the power for Aita Powers. So there's a lot to expect, really, on that night. That's your sport. My name is George Adi Jr. Israel joins us with some more. Have a good night. Sport. Seven BAFTA Awards, one of the last major award ceremonies before the Academy Awards, took place Sunday night in London. And it turns out the bookies were right again about the best film and best actor.
The British Academy of Film and Television Awards was held over the weekend with 12 Years a Slave's lead actor, Chiwetel Ejiofor, a British Nigerian, receiving the most prestigious award. It felt so great to be supported in that way um, by, you know, your, your peers and, uh, and friends and family. It was um, a really wonderful feeling. Somali-born Bakar Abdi won the Supporting Male Actor Award for his role in the movie Captain Phillips. American Hassel's Jennifer Lawrence won Best Supporting Actress with Blue Jasmine's lead actress Kate Blanchett taking the Best Actress Award. Gravity's director Alfonso Cuaron was adjudged the Best Director on the night. If the bookies are right, we might see the same winners when the Oscars are held in two weeks' time as Chiwetel remains a favorite to win the Best Actor Oscar. <laughs> DKB's performance at the just ended Senior Freak's Night Out, which made patrons asking for more, has indirectly answered the question on Ghanaian minds. Yes, there are still good comedians in Ghana. All they need is the platform. What is this news about Ghana being attacked by terrorists? Who is that terrorist going to attack Ghana? You are going to attack a plane with gun people. First of all, do you know the amount of money they have to save to get a plane ticket? The visa interview, counselor, and all of that. Now they've gotten their ticket, then the visa, they're in the plane. And let me tell you, gun people don't be, they don't get fired to what they're going to do. Where? America. They are used to it. That was Alabama. Was it They will start planning for the trip, then you just get up on the plane. Excuse me, I have bomb on this plane, I am going to bomb. Hold it, sit down. By the time you address them, the next thing you say, Osama Milad, on your ears, first floor. Obabam, where be you? Osama, my show. Now, he and his brothers in the play, where? Osama, Pokeko, Boa, Kerbo, Kerbo, Queen, in your queen, a queen. Oh, they will fratulate. The whole plane will be full of fratulence. Now, you, the bomber, you can't bomb, you have to run away. So, the next thing you say, Ahmed, hey, Ahmed, no, I can't take this. These people are very disgusting. I want to bomb you flatly the whole place. Let's go. Let's take the bomb and let's go. <laughs> That's it for showbiz. Sure, showbiz sure, was brought. That's it for the bulletin before we go. The quick run through our story is nearly half of Accra residents to be without water for four days next week as Ghana Water Company shuts down for treatment plan for major rehabilitation works. Patients at country's hospitals said to be suffering abuse of their rights due to a general lack of awareness of the patient's charter. Patients elsewhere at the Tamale Teaching Hospital allege widespread corruption and extortion by staff. Ghana Armed Forces urge media to refrain from speculating motives leading to recent death of military couple. And tax experts caution government against simply increasing tax rates in its quest to raise more revenue, warning it could backfire. And that'll be all for the bulletin. My name is Israel Lai. Have a good evening.